Good evening, everybody. This is Stuart Duncan. I'm representing uh, NOSP over in Norway, the Norwegian Foreign Forestry Survey and Positioning, and also the um, uh, Scottish Hydrographic Society. Uh, we have had a few absentees at the, the last couple of days, so I will be your host for this evening. I look forward to a lot of uh, very interesting presentations. We have three in total uh, with four presenters and um, we will also have of course in the discord room Selena will be my uh, assistant and she will be able to field any questions that you have I would ask you if you do have any questions of course try to keep them to the end we can actually obviously uh, write them midway through and we will table the questions to each presenter as we go along so I would just like to say a few things just before we get started with the first presentation, which will be by uh, from Fugro, um, from Sony Dine, apologies. So uh, just would like to say a big thank you uh, once again, and we always do this, and it's very important because basically we cannot survive without their support. Uh, the uh, sponsors that you see on the screen in front of you, uh, that's from the NOSP, NOSP perspective. I'm. A little bit unsure on the uh, Scottish Hydrographic Society perspective, but they no doubt they're all volunteers and uh, require sponsorship as well. But take a good look at the screen. There's a lot of very important companies, a lot of good companies. My company is there. Um, and most of the presenters who uh, are presenting this evening are represented here as well. Um, just with uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, this is going to be challenging. Uh, No, I can't get. Can I get to the next slide? Okay, well, there's a couple of um, events that are occurring over the uh, the next uh, couple of months. I really do need this slide in front of me. Hang on, two seconds, people. Okay, I can't get that. I can't get that other slide up and running. But there are some events. There are two events, unfortunately, that are clashing, both on the Scottish uh, Hydrographic Society side and on our side. Uh, I will try to get that sorted for the end. So maybe I can just uh, uh, crack on with a little bit of uh, the presentations. First off, uh, tonight we have um, Geraint, um, uh, going west from Sonodyne. A very uh, Sonodyne do not need any sort of introduction, in my opinion. A very well established UK company, and um, uh, we were uh, Geraint, uh, the business development manager, has only recently been there three years, I think, but has a, a very impressive CV. Um, uh, so he will be talking about the um, the current measurements with pies. Uh, I'm very keen to find out what that acronym is. So we will move uh, swiftly on. I will um, bring uh, Geraint into the picture. This is my first time doing this, so please apologize for any of the, um, any mistakes being made here. So I'm gonna bring Geraint into the picture now. I'm gonna re oh. Good evening, Geraint, welcome. Good, good evening to you. I would, um, I, would, I had a couple of questions before we get started so we can get set the scene a little bit. Um, you've been working for Sonodyne for a few years. Uh, are they still privately owned or did they succumb to public? Uh, is it still owned by Mr. Partridge? Still owned by Mr. Partridge. And um, I think some of you will be aware that we've been expanding over the past couple of years. So Ivor uh, joined us most recently, but also uh, Chelsea Technologies. Uh, joined us last year um and um oh sorry even more recently to to uh two g robotics from canada joined uh Sonine. so so uh, quite a growing group but still privately owned very good it's quite an acquisition with Ivor, i imagine and there will no doubt be some questions about how that relationship will be uh blossoming going forward i'm certainly very keen to know so i'm going to put your uh presentation on the screen now and i will then remove myself and uh, you are free to uh start the evening 
Brilliant. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, I think as explained, uh, I've been with Sonodyne now, um, actually for, for just coming up to five years. Prior to that, I was at the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton. Um, so been around a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk to you this evening about pies. And first of all, to explain, um, we are we are not talking about the edible sorts here. Um, what we're going to be talking about is something called the pressure inverted echo sounder. Um, so what I'm going to give you is a quick basic instrument overview, uh, talk a little bit about pies to derive currents. Um, I'm then going to talk a little bit about a trial we did in the Pacific with the University of Rhode Island, and then finishing up with a deployment of an array in the Gulf of Mexico. So first of all, hitting the basic instrument overview, um, the PIES is a, is a long life seabed uh, autonomous logging instrument. Um, and essentially what it does is two things. It measures the acoustic two-way travel time between the seabed and the surface. And that's a term that is usually referred to as tau when you speak to the academic community. And secondly, high resolution pressure at the seabed. Uh, the sonar instrument actually also comprises an integrated high-speed acoustic modem, uh, and that's important for two perspectives. One, for recovery of data, but also, importantly, for remote instrument configuration. So if you want to check things like battery power, uh, you want to change the logging period, uh, you can do all of those things remotely via the acoustics. The basic case of the operation is essentially generating um, a, a replica of the transmitted signal uh, uh, and the rec received acoustic waveform. If you look at a zoom in uh, of that middle graph that you can see there, or plot that you can see there, that's where you can see in the bottom right is a zoom in. And it wasn't showing to you is that it's relatively easy to find the first arrival, and that equates to the shortest ray path. The two-way travel time is calculated from the cross-correlation of the recorded and transmitted waveforms. Um, so without going into too much of the complexity, that's that's the simple way we measure the, the two-way travel time. Importantly, and we'll touch on this in a couple of later slides, um, there's, a, there's a significant impact of surface conditions on acoustic return, and, and, and that's not really surprising. Um, what you can see in the middle there is a graph of a baseband. So you're looking at time uh, in the vertical and then um, dates as you go across the bottom there. And what it's showing is the evolution of the baseband signal over a period of several days. Um, you can see there with the, uh, the, the, the bottom sort of undulating line that the range gate changes gracefully with tidal pressure. So that's what you're seeing there is the tidal cycle. Uh, and then what we also see in that is that periods of low sea state show a, a larger, stronger, and more specular surface return from the surface. Uh, and that's what the two diagrams on the left and the right are showing. You know, when you've got that very uh, flat sea surface, the, the, the single return path is, uh, is, is the, the direct one and much of the energy is reflected away. Whereas when you've got a rough sea surface, you'll, you'll get multiple return paths. Um, just to confuse you a little bit more, uh, typically in, in Sonodyne, we, we call the larger instrument something called Fetch. Um, but the basic instrument here is a PIES instrument. I'm not going to run through the whole slide here because there's quite a lot for you to just read there. Uh, but as I said, importantly, this instrument uh, includes uh, Sonodyne 6G wideband telemetry, which is really important for, for data recovery and configuration. You can also see there in a range of standard sensors like inclinometer, battery temperature, etc. And then um, with this instrument, we can actually put in uh, several um, pressure sensors in here, mainly digicorts, uh, but there's also optional presense or Keller. Uh, well, that's all on a single pressure port with diaphragm. So. Sorry, this is the bit where it all gets a little bit complex. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we actually use PIES to derive currents. First of all, to note that PIES has been used in the oil and gas industry to make direct measurements of sound velocity, um, correction of seismic data for some time. And, and we, we supply quite, quite a lot of units to do that. 
Importantly, though, you can use a network of pies for physical oceanographic studies to study geostrophic currents. Uh, most of you, I hope, will be uh, familiar with what geostrophy means, but essentially it's exactly the same as we when we look at pressure systems in weather. So you look at uh, the movement of, of, of the pressure gradient forces, uh, and that's all balanced by the Coriolis effect. So typically the geostrophic flow is parallel to the isobars. Um, you know, it, in the northern hemisphere, high pressure is to the right of the flow and into the left in, in the southern hemisphere. We can use, though, in historical vertical profiles of seawater density to infer the ocean currents from pies. And I'm going to get into that a little bit now. Two-way travel time is, is really significant here uh, because the two-way travel time at any pressure is linearly related to the, 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 the tau or the, the two-way travel time at any other deep pressure. And that's actually reasonably intuitive. Uh, hopefully, this animation will run. So if I look there at the water column on the left, where I've got more warm water in there, the sound actually travels faster than and on the right, where uh, there's more cooler column, more cooler water. And so I end up with a comparison between a shallow and a deep therm thermocline. There's a robust empirical relationship between that two-way travel time and the vertical profiles of temperature, salinity, and density. And how those are related uh, is using something called the Gravis empirical mode or something the GEM method. And this is something that Watson Rossby uh, over in the USA really uh, put together. So let's unpack that a little bit. On the left there, what you see is uh, a compilation of a whole bunch of CTD casts, so uh, conductivity temperature depth, depth casts. And so what we've got is a pressure versus um, the depth uh, and the temperature. If we put all those together uh, and then look at our main region here, and what we've what this diagram actually looks at is a represented region between 150 and 1,000 meters deep. We can then, then fit cubic splines to that, that data to create a lookup table. So by having a, a two-way travel time or tau, we can then look at that and relate that to a typical CTD profile uh, that relates to that tau. And that's the basic principle. That therefore means that w w we can measure a variety of variables with different pies configurations. So with uh, a single pies, we can measure things like ocean tide, the thermocline depth, uh, the, the, the sea height anomaly, heat storage, etc. But if we go all the way down to 2D, 2D array, because we can actually measure that pro pressure surface, we can turn around and produce a 4D map of horizontal velocity and density or actually a current, current map. So moving on to the trial we did in, in the Pacific. And as mentioned in those earlier slides, the real pioneers of pi for oceanographic studies has been the University of Rhode Island. So what, what we did the other year was carry out a back-to-back -back trial in the Pacific between uh, the University of Rhode Island's own instruments and sonar instruments. And these were the these were the three types of instruments used in that trial. I've mentioned the fetch um, type instrument. That's the one in the, the center column there. Um, that's basically an 18 inch glass sphere in a hard hat, uh, and that has the advantages of giving us more battery uh, capability and therefore longer endurance, up to up to eight years. On the left there, uh, something that looks an awful lot like uh, a compact, many of you will be familiar with, uh, and that's ex exactly what it is. It's a derivative of, of our, our compact. And then on the right is the URI, URI C pies. That C is put in there is because what they do is combine it with a current meter, which is on a mooring about 10 to 15 meters above the pies itself. The area of study was the Hydrate Ridge, which is in the, near the Cascadia subduction zone off Oregon. Uh, and we deployed uh, four URIC pies 
uh, two of which were co-sited with the, with the solar line pies. And that's at these two sites. One was in deeper water, close to 3,000 metres, uh, and that's the one that used the, um, the fetch pies. And then the shallow water was in 1,300 metres uh, using uh, the compact derivative. A lot going on here. Um, so what you're looking at there is those two sites. And we're looking at, at, at raw time of time of flight. In the top there, you've got the full period of observations. And in the bottom, you've got a, a blow up of uh, a section of that data, just a few days of data. The data in blue is from the stoner dial instrument and the data in green is from the URI instrument. And what's immediately obvious from this is that there is a lot more noise and scatter in the University of Rhode Island's instrument. That was, of course, important for us in Sonoline because what it did prove to uh, the URI was the value of our, our instruments um, and has since generated the project that I'll be talking about in a little bit. But before I do that, I'm going to uh, look at some another interesting aspect of PIES, um, which is exploring further that whole effect of surface reflection under different uh, wave conditions. So the PIES uses a, a 250 millisecond sampling window. Uh, and what you can immediately see from this, of uh, these two sets of data from the, from the two sites, is clear correspondence between periods of strong specular return and periods where um, there's not been such a specular return. However, in the shallow site, there is, is much more stronger general return. That's due to the shallow water and the smaller acoustic fit, footprint. The reason why you can see an offset there is that we have to use a trigger window. So there's a pre-trigger on this one. Um, and so in uh, the O1 site, uh, we use the 9% pre-trigger, whereas in the O3 site, we use the 55% trigger, which is why you've got that big area of, of black, no data in the bottom of it. Uh, and we do actually lose a little bit of the return in the, in the top of the, the graph. This graph, though, compares data uh, that was the wind speed data that was collected at a site um, very close to the, the PIES deployment site. And you can see very clearly that those low wind speeds coincide with short ring downs in the baseband signals. You can take that a step further, actually, by doing this uh, and looking at the half-life metric of the decay of that, that signal. And when you do that, you get even stronger correspondence between the, uh, the wind speed on the surface and the half-life of the decay of the signal. So you've almost got a subsea uh, wind speed indicator. Of course, the one thing it doesn't give you is, is, is direction of that wind. So I'm going to now move on to uh, where we took this, which is a Gulf of, of Mexico array. Um, and I'm sure some of you are very familiar with the Gulf of Mexico, but a, a particular feature of the Gulf of Mexico is the Gulf Loop current system. This is uh, where the Yucatan current comes up uh, past the Yucatan Peninsula uh, into the Gulf of Mexico. And under uh, normal circumstances, it follows this protracted loop current path. And so it curves slightly up into the, the, the Gulf and then exits through the Florida Straits. However, occasionally that loop current extends way up into the Gulf um, where it can have a significant impact uh, both on uh, offshore operations, but also importantly, hurricane forecasting. Occasionally, that circulation breaks off as a loop current eddy, and these events are actually so significant that they are named much the way, uh, same way as storms are. Moving on and looking at that from, from above, this is obviously satellite imagery and it, and it gives you a clearer, well, I'd say actually a more complex view of, of what that circulation looks like. It's never as clean as those yellow arrows and you can see various eddies breaking off there and you can see that, uh, that loop current uh, in the extended state. So the deployment area um, was in this area up to the northern part of that extended loop. Uh, we deployed five Sonodyne PIES units together with a combination of University of Rhode Island units and uh, BOEM units. 
Pi space is actually about 50 kilometers apart, and the initial network was deployed in, in May 2019. If we look a little bit more detail at those five sonar line uh, pies, uh, we're going to take these five and, and look a little bit more at the, at the data. So this was data that was collected from the first data harvest, which was done um, in a, a September, October uh, last year. And what you can see here is the time of flight. This is the raw time of flight. Um, and the cross-correlated signal. At A02, which is the most north northwest of the site, you can see a lot of early returns there throughout the three-and-a-half-month period. Um, this is primarily due to fish technology. And then you can see a common uh, event there, which occurs in July uh, across all of those. And that's the passage of Hurricane Barry. And I'm going to look at that in, a, in more detail as well. So this is the track of Hurricane Barry uh, between the 10th and the 14th of July. Uh, those are the six hourly positions. And you can see that uh, we're just going to look at these three sites uh, which were close to, to that hurricane path. And these are, these are the graphs from that. So there's some interesting differences going on here. Um, if you look at B02, um, B03, you can see... Uh, a decrease in time of flight before the hurricane, which is due to warmer water coming in, increasing that speed, and then cooling water after, so that increases, that increases the time of flight. A02, though, shows some quite different uh, signals here. Uh, so you've got a lot of early returns, and some people have postulated that this is actually uh, fish activity who have sensed the, the uh, hurricane coming in and swimming away from it. Um, but also there's um, migration of fish. What's very interesting about this event that occurred in July was that the loop current eddy uh, names further up because it's around this period and actually persisted till about October that year, uh, all associated with the hurricane. At present, um, that array that I showed you um, is the data from it's collected periodically by research vessels, which is sufficient to provide significant academic insight into the system's behavior. But it's no good as a real-time forecasting system. So one of the ideas proposed was to expand this ray, and that's those extra red triangles you can see there for a 10-year deployment. However, what that requires is the collection of data every one to two weeks for combination, uh, combining with numerical modeling. So one of the things we looked at was how we'd actually run that. Uh, and that was uh, looking at using a USV um, to collect that data. So you need that data, as I say, about every 11 days. And so the concept was to use a, uh, a fleet of USVs, potentially up to four, running a continuous racetrack. That has other advantages, of course, in that you can put ADCPs on the, the vehicle itself to, to ground truth the near surface currents. The bad news is that, unfortunately, the concept is currently on hold due to funding issues, um, but it does provide a, a nice glimpse into how in-situ observational networks can be supported in the future. The good news, though, is the data from the array was harvested last week, and the reports are that the data looks quality looks high, and the battery use is, uh, quote, more than acceptable. So the plan is to currently leave these units in the water until July next year. So just to wrap up, uh, PIES is a mature technology for large-scale current observations, I think uh, you, you've probably seen from, from this presentation. Importantly, the latest technology is designed for long-term deployments and remote operation, which is making uh, deployments of these instruments much more economic uh, and attractive for the kind of forecasting uh, and monitoring that we've, we've seen. I also want to acknowledge the cooperation, the really good cooperation we've had with the University of Rhode Island, um, which is generating mutual benefits to us both. So thanks for listening. Uh, I'll take questions in a, in a bit. Um, my personal contacts details are on there if you want to uh, ask any questions down the line that you don't think of this evening. But what I would also say is there's a fantastic white paper on PIES on our website. 
uh, which you can just uh, register to receive by going onto that website. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Grant. That was very interesting. Uh, somewhat highbrow, I imagine, for some listeners, but uh, certainly myself, um, but very interesting nonetheless. I just I have a number of questions, which is uh, good. We've got them coming in from people uh, viewing in. A um, couple from myself as well. What kind of uh, percentage of the work that Sonodyne has now is kind of MetOcean and this type of discipline? This is not, I understand, Sonodyne from LBL, USBL, and, and that that line of thing but is how, how much and do you see that just expanding over the next few years yeah i mean um met ocean per se it still remains a pretty small part of our business but i mean my role is to to work with the ocean science community so actually um the kind of uh, projects i'm working on range from everything from doing from plate tectonic movement to uh, uh measuring that to doing this kind of thing where we're, we're taking technology which in many ways has been intended for another purpose i mean we develop pies primarily for the seismic community um but by taking that proven technology and taking it into other areas uh it certainly helps to diversify the business significantly okay and obviously as part of all the instrumentation it's very well you are reliant on a lot of sensors and the collation of a lot of sensors what uh, what can you expect from uh, the degradation of the equipment over time how do you counter or how do you uh, cater for that in, in on these long-term deployments yeah i mean the biggest problem with these type of deployments is actually pressure sensor drift um i mean you know an obvious question when you look at the configuration of the instrument is why would you need three you know several pressure sensors well pressure sensors all have their different characteristics um and so you know these courts are, are are accurate um keller presense um have their own characteristics um and some of the things that we do with those is is, is like pre-characterizing the pressure sensors beforehand so we can look at their drift rates before deployment um we're also now uh, deploying technology, something called ambient zero ambient, which is effectively doing in situ calibration of the pressure sensors on the seabed. Uh, and that's really changing the uh, game changer, I think, as far as pressure sensing at the seabed is concerned over long term deployments for the future. So that has applications which is are, are, are important for this. Uh, for pies, but also importantly for things, as I mentioned earlier on, about um, doing site, doing um, plate tectonic uh, monitoring of the seabed as well. Yeah, interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a couple more questions. Uh, especially, mm -hmm. I'd like to thank the people who have uh, put some questions forward. Elaine has asked, "What about turbidity and fish shoals?" You did allude to it during your presentation. Maybe you could expand upon that and how how you see that and how that affects things. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously, you know, one one person's noise is another man's signal is a, is an overused phrase, but I think it's 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 really important this one. So the scientists we work with at URI are are interested in the underlying signal there to be able to measure the currents. Um, however, you know, there is interest in using these systems to measure the um, the the, the biological activity um and and you can remove that reasonably easily uh, if if you need to equally uh, other people have looked at them for um measuring ambient noise because you've got si systems in situ for long periods of, of, of time admittedly yeah. that's over over relatively narrow bandwidth but it's an important measurement okay um a couple more questions. Well, it's a good. They're coming in thick and fast, as they say. Uh, how does the water depth affect Pi's system performance, i.e., minimum operational uh, depth? Yeah, um, it's a it's a trade off, as I think you could mm. see there between the comparison we did at, in the trial in the Pacific, the characteristics that you measure in shallow water and, and I mean thousand meters in, in in this situation was, was shallow water compared to three thousand three thousand meters so um, interestingly enough we have recently deployed or sorry we're about to deploy a, uh, a system actually for 
seismic uh, this for plate tectonic um, measurement of Canada. Um, but several of those units are going in quite shallow water in a few hundred meters of water uh, with Pi's functionality. So we're quite interested to see how they're going to perform in such shallow water. Um, sorry, I, I haven't really answered the question directly, but, but you know. That's it, quite okay. <laughs> it, it is an issue. Yeah, okay. Uh, towards the end, you mentioned something that a lot of people are talking about in this industry and the unmanned systems, the AUVs, and there seems to be what everyone's talking about. And Fugro, I know, uh, will be talking not next, but they certainly have that on their radar. Um, uh, can Sonda and I provide their experience using unmanned systems? It might, uh, or to harvest Pi's data. Can you expand a little bit more? Why is that suddenly stopped as well? You mentioned that due to funding, uh, that's a collaboration. Can you expand a little bit on that? Well, well, that it, this particular project stopped because the funding agency in the USA um, took another think about whether it wanted to deploy a ten-year system. Um, the reality is that uh, USV harvesting of data is becoming relatively routine now. Um, so within the oil and gas arena, we have been using people like X-Ocean to harvest data from um, seabed sensors in the Orman Langer field. Um, we've been using wave gliders to harvest data from uh, instruments off uh, the coast of Chile in, uh, in excess of 5,000 meters. Um, yeah, we're now using quite a wide variety of vehicles, unmanned vehicles, uh, to harvest data, and it's becoming more and more routine. Mm. I think it's interesting in the fact that we have a predetermined uh, vision of how these these will work, these AU, AS, ASV, AUVs, not AUVs, but the unmanned vehicles. But to see this, I, this is the first time I've seen it in a different forum. So it's quite interesting to see that it's not just that one area that they're going to be used in. As, as any technology, it starts to evolve and you see benefits uh, on the periphery and something. And that's yeah, and, and, and more so than in the current environment where you know, we've yeah. been doing seen, um, half seen of data in the North Sea uh, with unmanned surface vehicles um, under conditions where you you don't have to put people out out on the ground. Um, you, yeah, it's it's exactly. it's, a, it's a way to keep the business going. Exactly, exactly. Okay, I've got one last question. I'm going to read it verbatim from the screen. Can you mention the application of Pi's units to measure tides during ocean bottom node seismic acquisition operations? Um, a little, uh, a brief one. Then we should move on. I think. Yeah, I mean it. it it's it's not. Not really my particular field. One of my other colleagues um, is more interested in, in, in this and, and works with that type of customer. But as you could see from one of my slides, the uh, measurement of tides, the, the, the curves you can see there, that comes directly out of the pressure measurements. Um, yeah. uh, and so uh, actually extraction of um, tidal coefficients from the data is, is, is fairly routine and, uh, and done on a regular basis. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. I much appreciate it. It was very interesting. And uh, also, it's always a pleasure to speak to anyone from Sony Dine, in my opinion. Um, thank you very much. I will well, now thank withdraw. You. Oh, thank you. And I'll withdraw you from the, uh, from the stream. Okay. So I'm back again. I uh, Hopefully I've got to grips with my uh, teething issues that I had a little bit earlier. I'm going to just share my other screen um, if I can find it and I can't. So I'm not going to do it this time. I'm going to just crack on. Right, the next um, presenter we have uh, is Andrew Gowland from, um, from Fugro. And he's going to be talking uh, about um, uh, wind and wave monitoring. So I will bring Andrew, into the picture, we have a couple of challenges on this one, so I ask people to be patient. But again, do provide some questions once you've uh, once you through the uh, through the presentation from Andrew. Uh, we were going to be looking at a video that we hope will be seamless to you uh, looking in, but there's no they're very stressful for us here. But uh, we'll bring in Andrew. Good uh, good evening, Andrew. Thank you for joining us. Um, You've, you're much like myself, a bit of a project manager. Now you're the commercial manager at, uh, at Fugro. Uh, Fugro don't need any introduction as well. Um, you're going to be talking about wind and wave monitoring. So is there any, would you like to say a few words before you start? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, 
firstly, thank you for uh, having me. Um, I'll just make mine a full screen so that you can, there you go. Is that better? There we go. That's much better. Uh, Excellent. Okay, cool. Um, so put this uh, presentation together um, for you guys in the audience. Um, it might jump around a bit, but we'll see how it goes. Um, yes, okay. my, my background is um, project management, working with government um, coastal regions, um, and now fairly recently moved into the uh, commercial manager role for in the measurements team. Uh, okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Right, well, I will escape from the uh, from the forum and uh, provide you with uh, what you need. So, good luck and speak to you in about twenty minutes. Thanks. Right, hello everyone. Um, so, yeah, as as, as introduced, my name's Andrew, but my friends call me Drew. So, um, that explains my D Gowland at Fugo.com, commercial manager, project manager, oceanographer. Um, uh, I apologise that I'm looking at the screen. I know the camera is here, so uh, please bear with the, the profile view. Um, this presentation will give a very basic, it's, it's nothing like the Sony 9-1, I'm not going to go into great depth um, and detail. It's a basic view of uh, window wave monitoring. Um, then I'm going to take a, a small two-minute break to bring up a a fairly recent Fugro video, well, Stuart, well, um, showing our remote operation sensors capability. It's quite a new feature and very apt for current um, unprecedented times. Then I'll move on with a, a bit more of a focus on um, the actual effects of uh, wind and waves and why we would want to monitor them. So, firstly, where to monitor, when to monitor, how to monitor, and what to monitor. Um, as we know, all offshore um, projects are impacted by um, metocean conditions, so obviously this time more specifically wind and wave, um, and also, of course, wind-driven waves. So the management of the metocean risks and the dangers that um, these um, factors push upon our assets and, and features at, at sea um, uh, integral to pushing forward um, the project life cycle um, safety um, and efficiencies arise when you put together lots of uh, different service packages. Um, Here I've brought up uh, offshore wind life cycle example. Um, we've got the site selection and feasibility, development and consent, design and certification, installation, operation and maintenance, and decommissioning of uh, offshore wind. Um, yeah. When you go through the slides later, if you uh, would like to, you can go into these in further detail, but you can see that in situ measurements do feature in a lot of these steps, but of course, uh, desktop studies, uh, hindcasts, forecasts are all integral uh, parts of a uh, life cycle. So here it is brought uh, into more simplistic view. We've got the meditation desk studies. I wonder if I can zoom in. Yeah. A bit. So we've got significant wave height here um, spanning across uh, a year of study and it gives um, wave heights uh, per percentile in month. Um, obviously moving on to Metation data collection real-time monitoring, which I'm more uh, accustomed to in my project management role. Um, but from those data that we collect, um, we have a team dedicated to forecasting and they do a fantastic job and with hindsight, um, um, hindcast, sorry, modeling, we can um, bring those features together. So where and what? Um, obviously we said about offshore, but if uh, it's a coastal location, you can actually use uh, landmass um, or ports um, 
shallow coastline, you've got to really pay attention to your coastal diversity, um, all the offshore exposures in deeper water, and of course, um, the seabed dynamics and where those features are. Um, your mountains, as I said a second ago, got towers, buildings, uh, fixed platforms, ports, um, oil rigs, uh, jack-ups, um, and then of course you can uh, have your um, Metocean buoys and even instrumentation on the mooring of those coins. The standard parameters that we like to record or the clients like to receive uh, for waves would be a typical timestamp position, uh, your maximum wave heights, significant wave heights, um, wave periods, zero crossings, direction, sea temperature, uh, things like that. Um, I am fully aware there are a lot of other meta ocean parameters, and I'm trying to, trying to keep it onto these two. Um, so, meteorological, again, timestamp position. Um, and then you've got the wind speed, you've got the gusts, um, which can be um, averaged over certain periods, um, wind direction, and then temperature, um, pressure, other parameters such as precipitation. So, um, quite a nice clear picture um, going on to the offshore monitoring and how we actually monitor it. Like I say, I'm going to keep it simple. Um, so. We have a nice picture of the wave works there up on a turbine. Uh, next, we come on to real-time uh, instrumentation. Um, there's a, a whole array of buoys out there. Um, you've got your single parameter ones, which solely record waves, um, and multi-parameter, such as the one on the right, the uh, Sea-Watch MIDI. Um, that one does uh, a whole plethora of um, pieces, uh, pick that picture just because it's got the MET station array on top and obviously the, the wave platform is inside the buoy and it can do both. Um, I'll, I'll go on to it later, although it's not quite applicable, but uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, uh, cavities within the buoy where you can um, insert current meters and things like that and start um, getting other MET ocean parameters. Along with the real-time uh, monitoring, uh, we can monitor waves um, from fixed locations. Uh, we saw the preceding wave wrecks slide. Um, here's one on a port wall, uh, downward facing rain radar, um, conical beam, um, gives uh, very, I think it's 10 hertz feedback on, on that. Um, you've got in the middle there, White Sound Meteorological Station, <coughs> excuse me, um, sometimes used um, in coastal locations, you can tie them in with a buoy out of sea, correlate the data there, or even you have the White Sound mounted on uh, a buoy at sea. Um, on the right, top right, you have a LiDAR buoy. Now they're mounted on another Sea Watch uh, wave scan buoy. Um, those boys are robust. They've been around for years. Um, and now, more recently, um, incorporating a LiDAR on top. And that's quite um, a sought after piece of kit at the moment. Um, but the, the functionality of the LiDAR is to uh, uh, emit light detection uh, and ranging signals up. Uh, in the middle there at the bottom, you've got a um, ADCP, so that one is actually a, a horizontal profiler. Um, an example of a, uh, a project there would be you could correlate it in with the wave wrecks. I know um, our colleagues in the Americas have up in Alaska. Um, the horizontal ADCP would actually be down in the water column instead of reading the surface, it reads the orbital velocities um, of the waves coming down in the water column. So that's quite a, quite a different way of um, modeling waves. All of these uh, um, 
uh, boys and things like that, you can have real-time display uh, features. Um, of course, each um, boy or piece of instrumentation can be um, put together, built for clients. Uh, specific requirements. I've actually left the boy there without a top on because you can have the standard, you know, tripod with the mythological array or you can have a LiDAR on there. Um, and then the mooring system needs to be um, made to suit. However, um, your real-time display on the right here gives all of the agreed parameters in quite a clear format um, and can uh, be configured to client requirements. So offline um, systems, um, I say generally because you can use acoustic modems and ping data back up and to them to the MOVA, um, uh, say Iridium or uh, another platform, but um, much like um, Sonodyne, we're talking acoustic themes here, um, it's an AWAC there on the left um, out in the Americas. But these are seabed mounted, um, say on a, a pop up system, L shaped mooring. Um, but they actually monitor from the seabed upwards, ping, and do um, surface tracking um, for waves. The other parameters these can do, um, like I say, I won't digress into those, but there's currents. Yes, CTD, which is conductivity, temperature, depth, um, water quality, suspended solids, um, can even, yeah, I won't go into that one too much. So the uh, MetOcean system benefits, um, oh, sorry, I clicked on one too far. Uh, MetOcean system benefits, um, like I mentioned earlier, configurable to client requirements. Um, you can have a Quite a variety of service period, three months, six months, 12 months, uh, depending on where they're mounted. If it's if it's a coastal region, you can get to them quite easy. If it's a platform, you can um, uh, fly out and transfer. Um, but it also depends on battery life. As you can see on the boys here, there are solar panels which have prolonged life. Um, but we've had a lot of these systems in place either you know, food road manufactured, built, made, or um, other, um, other pieces of equipment from other bodies. Um, well over 10 year lifespans on all of them, all robust, highly visible. I've got highly visible just to, you know, yellow, IALA colors, um, even the seabed mounts, you can have surface marker boys if need be. And of course, as with all assets, you can have it target specific um, and just put into place for the amount of time you need, be it a lunar cycle or be it a whole project cycle of you know, 20 years. Um, just make sure you have your servicing regime in place. Um, next slide is the one with the video. I'm going to shoot back to uh, Stuart, please. And right. he's going to play it for us. It's I'm, going to back, I'm, going to, I'm going to actually ask you a quick question before we continue. How much of this work um, do you see now within the renewables market? Is this now, do you see a growth uh, going forward within the renewables market for the MetOcean type data? Yeah, I mean, hugely. The, the, the renewables market um, is, is growing. Um, obviously, we, we being such a huge company um, and, and we're worldwide, we're still in the oil and gas game as well. Um, but from, say, personally, in our department, we are 100% um, in renewables or local government, no oil and gas. But we do have oil and gas specific departments as well. Okay. Um, yeah, it's uh, turbines uh, are on the increase. For, for Everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, I'll, I think I've got my video up and running now for you, so I'll just press play. I'm going to remove myself from the it and uh, just let me know when it's and I'll uh, carry on. Very good. Thank you.
Right, I, I believe that possibly we didn't have any sound on that. I'm not too sure if you did, uh, Andrew. I, I certainly did, uh, but maybe the viewers did not, and I apologise for that. We'll try to get rectify that for the next video. Um, interesting, certainly, um, where you're going with that. I'll just remove that and put your other presentation back. We're, we're, so I will, if that's the continuation of the presentation, I will then leave you to it. Is that correct, Andrew? Yeah, thank you very much. I'll go back one side then. So, yeah, basically it's the... It's, a, a slightly um, newer aspect of, of food grow within remote operation centers. Um, really fantastic um, innovation of ours. Um, there is the video link on the slides if people want to um, view it and you can find it quite easily on, on YouTube. Um, so moving on, it also gives you a break from me droning on during this presentation. So I thought I'd break it up. This is might be the third part, um, uh, sort of honing in on structural monitoring um, and maybe why we monitor uh, wind and waves in not, it, it's slightly different. Usually we think of operational aspect, um, but this one's actually making sure that structure, structural integrity um, is uh, monitored with the increase in turbines, as Stuart said, um, increase in renewables, um, things are getting bigger, um, heavier. Um, see by this slide, um, power generating life of 20 to 25 years on a turbine. Um, lots of the sites are coastal at the moment. Um, if we don't go into the offshore floating wind, which is a whole other presentation we could put together, um, the turbine capacity is increasing. They're subject to such um, huge wind and wave forces that, that they have to be well bigger with the capacity, taller and heavier. So the foundations are subject to, to higher loads um, and um, the costs are increasing. So obviously um, if people want to look after their, their investment. Um, so the issue here really is the, the scallop. This is what we're going to quickly look into, um, the response of uh, turbines um, is, is affected by scour around the, the potential scour, let's say, around the turbine base. We've got a monopile here, um, obviously there's lots of different um, boys, the spar, barge, um, tension, lead, um, semi-submersibles, but all of them have a tethering point. Uh, on this one, we're going to look at the monopile because it's so much easier to focus in on and see the scour in action. Um, you've got a scour can affect the actual um, turbine frequency. Um, it changes the soil, soil stiffness, the, which the foundations are in. Obviously, if you can imagine the, the monopile agitating that, the, the sand, the soil, the, the bed. Um, you're going to start changing the vibration of the turbine, um, which is something you need to monitor because obviously it can lead to complication. Um, the motion, um, there are two things. So we've got a motion sensor, which you can put inside the turbines, um, and also a scour package, um, which is another acoustic uh, beam device um, that pings downwards. We'll go on to that in the next few slides. So, oh, sorry, again, I've gone too far. So the motion logger um, sits in two parts of the turbine. On the right there, it's not very clear, but actually, if you can see my mouse pointer, under here, the Fugro, um, the Fugro motion logger is actually sat under there. And on this one, um, it's, it's tucked around the corner. I mean, they, they are minimalistic pieces of kit, um, and they are very sensitive to vibration. At the moment, these log internally. We go um, download the data and we can process that. We've got the upper and the lower, obviously, because it's two different frequencies, a lot more movement to the top, but you correlate both together. Um, and you've got the scour side. So these are quite nice, clear pictures to show where the actual scour happens. Um, you've got um, like I mentioned earlier, the, where the foundations are subject to high current areas, large wave sites, um, 
wind-driven waves in really exposed locations, you've got a lot more energy transfer and um, things can be subject to a lot more scour. The scour sensor actually mounts below the astro lowest astronomical tide so it never dries out uh, and monitors the seabed change um, by four beams, which we will go into next. Here we go. So this is the, the head of the unit, um, actually um, manufactured by Nortec. Um, but the angled beams are um, depicted here, these four beams, and they can show a variety of um, seabed change. Um, and what we can do now is also make the scan onto real time. So if you put a specific umbilical up to a platform, um, and then you can use a data transfer system to get that data back, or even have a, a live station on certain um, substation or something like that. Um, so you've got the long-term, short-term live data, um, or you take, you go again, it's recording internally, you can take the data off, process it, and pass on to, to whomever needs it. Um, it's, it's quite um, innovative, and, and you know, it, the, the, the beauty of it, it gives a longer term trend, as opposed to a spot sample that, um, um, say, a, a scanner going by would see that one one place, but this is over a long time, so it's um, much more viable um, depicting seabed change. This is another example of a uh, web, web page display. It's not just the scour scours up there on the left. The the data are four different head measurements, but what I've shown here is you can integrate it with say bottom left, the wave data, that's from a local boy, all the data can be sent in. And again, this goes back to the that uh, YouTube video, if you look at that, the ROC centers can integrate all these uh, pieces of data and send them out as one package. So in conclusion to the motion response, um, the motion of the towers, the turbines, are actually driven by the weight, um, and as your wave height increases, so does the tower displacement, um, disturbs the soil and the foundations, as we're saying, agitates things, um, and scour foundation it is more easily disturbed once that energy is there and loosening up those sediments. Um, you've got, oh, this is what I tried to bundle through a minute ago, um, the benefits of the monitoring, um, it's, it's live, it's there, or it's good process data and you can pick it up at any time. Um, I just leave this picture up for a second. I, I realize I'm going over on time, that's why I'm trying to speed up, but um, each of these dots uh, is, is an actual turbine, this is a whole array, and you can just see that just from the waves and currents coming past all the sediment plumes coming off each turbine. Um, I think it's quite a powerful image. Um, so, metaocean data collection summary, proven to positively impact the offshore projects by providing detailed site information, which can reduce uh, costs, definitely reduce risks, uh, help with scheduling and logistics. Um, and then you've got all those book points. I'm not going to go through because we're running out of time. Um, ultimately, go to one of my favorite slides, which um, all metocean data, not just wind and waves, uh, need to be the right data at the right time to the right people. Um, and I'll just leave you with that thought. Um, thanks for your time and listening. Stuart, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Drew. That was very interesting. Um, yeah, I think the advent of offshore wind i certainly was involved in a couple of installations a few years ago very interesting it was but uh, meth ocean wasn't uh, at the forefront then but um how many offshore wind turbines uh, this was a question that came in from stephen um, how many wind turbines now do actually uh, um, get the scale monitoring devices installed is that a relatively new uh, concept certainly wasn't uh, 
prevalent when I was uh, involved in Greater Gabbard and Gwinty Moor, but what, uh, uh, is this now the, the norm? Um, it, it isn't the norm, unfortunately. Um, I mean, if, it's really difficult. If you've got an a, array of 100 turbines, you could have one scan monitor on each one or one on each you know, quarter side, so to speak, so you can monitor the scan on each. It's, um, but all, all we're trying to do is um, highlight the fact that actually with the in increase in turbines and, and, and technology that scan monitors would be beneficial and the the sooner you can put them on, the better the cost saving. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's they they aren't by any stretch of the imagination on every turbine or array, um, but we'd like them to be. Yeah, <laughs> give it time, give it time. Um, there's a Fugra a Bermont in this uh, industry. Uh, do you is this all under one team or is this? Uh, or are you working with some third-party companies, or is it all in, all in-house? Like I say, Fugro and Enormous are a very capable company, but do you do you tap into some third-party uh, companies for a di for help? Um, I mean, so we are a, a global entity um, working throughout, um, well, everywhere. The the um, I think we're on about nine and a half thousand personnel at the moment. Um, we do with, work with third parties. Um, we try and innovate ourselves and, and keep things in-house, but where needed, we do bring in other specialists. The, the prime example there is the SCAR monitor working, you know, synergistically with, with Nortec to produce that, to try and um, move things forward um, for the greater good. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, LiDAR boys during the presentation as well. Um, can you please provide a little bit more information uh, about the wind profile capability of those? You, uh, that was quite an interesting one. Uh, yeah, so th there's a lot more interest in, in LiDAR boys at the moment. Um, I think they're, because of their multi-parameter uh, capabilities, um, the, the wind profile of, of a LiDAR boy um, can reach up to 300 meters. Um, it can do, I, I call them bins, up to up to ten bins to record. Um, I think there's there's low profile, uh, two meters, three point five, twelve, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, seventy-five, hundred. Okay. Yeah. You know, you know, it's incremental. Um, okay. But it, it it I think the the good thing about them is they. They work so well with turbines, and they can be programmable to record at certain levels mm -hmm. by the turbines. Are you also like much like um, Sonodyne, or using unmanned vehicles to to harvest some of this data as well? I mean, is uh, is, is yeah. that you? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, autonomous autonomous vehicles and the remote operating sensors, things like that. Is yeah. it, it's some people see that that is the future, you know. Yeah. Um, but in times like this, you don't want um, increased health and safety concerns. But um, that's not my area of expertise. But what I can do is perhaps um, put someone forward for a future talk on that side of things. For sure, it's certainly something that I was aware that Fugro were pushing. So uh, they naturally complements other services you you provide. Um, yeah. I have a question. Use of data analytics to automatically identify leading in indicators of turbine scour. Um, can do you want me to read that one again? <laughs> yeah, uh, the uh, the use. Uh, maybe you can expand on the, the use of data analytics to automatically identify leading indicators of turbine scour. Oh, leading indicators. Uh, you don't, feel, don't feel obliged to answer it here now. We can always see you can go on to the Discord later and um, uh, and answer it there. But uh, oh, no, uh, go on. I can try and do it a bit. Maybe I'm not answering the, the question fully, but I mean the the whole idea of the scan monitor is just to identify that pitting around the the piles. Um, we. We've seen, you know, scour pits from half a meter to fifteen meters deep. Yeah. You know, it's not not small. You know, these things can be quite large, and 
you know, remedial works don't automatically work. If you don't load boulders, it might not fill that gap. Um, yeah. But the leading indicators, I'm not sure. I think you'd have to go with some some further studies. I don't know, plume tracking around or sediment tracer surveys. Um, utilize other features. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because most, uh, well, it obviously depends on what uh, the soil, but most of them are driven down to approximately 30 or 40 meters. I know on Fugo do a lot of their own in installation or geotechnical work in advance of that. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you really do. Uh, Fugo really do do provide the whole uh, supply uh, chain. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, I've got another question here. How often is the data collected and interpreted? But maybe you've kind of alluded to that. It's it's available there all the time. Yeah, I mean, if, if, so yeah, if you if you've got it on the on the turbine, the turbine's just the example. I mean, this can be on port structures or jack ups or anything. But if it's if it's internally logging, it depends how big the, the battery package is. It can be three months, six months. Then you go out, download the data, uh, replace the batteries, and and carry on there. Yeah. Or yeah, like we were saying, if it's if it's live, you could have um, the data coming in as as desired. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's probably it for now. We haven't got any more questions, so I'd like to thank you very much for your time, Drew. That was uh, very interesting. Um, I will uh, remove you from the stream there. Uh, nothing personal, and we'll move on to the uh, the next one. So uh, I will try and share my screen again here, but just to say a little bit about some of the things that were happening with both the. Uh, the Scottish uh, Hydrographic Society. Uh, let me just see if I can share this. This is going to be a dual one here. So there, I, it's a bit rough around the edges. Apologies. What we've got here on the right is uh, some events that are happening simultaneously. It's a bit of an unfortunate clash in the diary. So for on the uh, 3rd and 5th of November, there's the IMCA Hydrographic Society and another uh, party, the combined event. Once again, because of COVID, it's been pushed online. And uh, so there is something there to attend. So I would recommend that anybody who's interested and has a couple of days free, I think it's a one day event now, instead of the 3rd to the 5th of November. I can't remember the details it's on this, so do apologize. But have a look on the Scottish Society's uh, uh, website for more details. Simultaneously, as I mentioned, there's something called the Digital Ocean Convention occurring in Rostock and mostly uh, driven by uh, a Norwegian um, um, uh, Innovation Norga. So lots of very interesting things happen there. Now, due to the fact that we have uh, in NOSP had to cancel our, well, not cancel, yes, we have canceled it. It's a dinner we normally have in late November, early December, early, early November. We've pushed it online and we would like to offer anybody who, any of our sponsors uh, and normally, uh, so each sponsor has a couple or maybe three participants who can partake in this. So if they would like any tickets to this digital uh, ocean convention, then it's just to get in touch with NOSP and we can provide you with some tickets. And I would encourage anybody else who's listening to go and have a look at that as well, because there are a lot of good presentations uh, during that day or two days and uh, just to follow, just go on, dig on the online digital ocean convention. Um, and then the January the 21st will be the next one for us uh, in, in, in usually would be in Oslo where once again we'll be online we may see depends what COVID is thrown up and what curveballs have arrived by then we'll see how we are getting on and hopefully we can actually have it in person but if it's not possible we'll go back online as we're all getting quite slick at this operation here so I will remove that and bring it in uh, Andrew uh, Wallace from Miros. Hello, Andrew. Good evening. Good evening, Stuart. Right. Okay. Maybe uh, uh, we have, as I do a little bit of an introduction here, uh, you've got, we've got uh, two presenters here. Trim is based in Oslo. Is that correct? Andrew, I don't know where you're based. Where are you? Um, I'm currently sitting in uh, sunny West Hill, so I'm um, probably one of the few people occupying the car parts out here at the moment. Okay, all right. Okay, um, so if I have a look here, I'll bring up uh, the Miros uh, presentation. Um, at some point, you're going to provide uh, maybe five, ten minutes, and then Trim will uh, get deep into the science behind all this. So, yeah. yeah. 
Thank you. Very I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about Miros or, uh, before. I had to have a look online, and I'm very keen to find out some more from what you're about to tell me. So uh, yeah. take it away. Okay. Okay. We've got a little video to to, uh, to play first of all. So uh, Stuart, if you could key that up, that'd be great. Very good point. Right now, hopefully, I can get the sound right on this one. So I will remove that. Uh, okay. Hang on. I've got. Now then, I'm not convinced this is going to work, but someone will kindly tell me in the forum if that's... Um... Uh, can you hear that? No right, let's do this properly. <laughs> Let me just uh, remove that from the screen. I'm going to try and share the screen again. One second. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about Miros, uh, Andrew. Um, yeah, so maybe we could just uh, well, okay, so I'll just jump through a couple of slides and then we can round it off with the uh, round it off with the, the little video at the end of it. So um, Miros, um, are, we're a provider of uh, drive sensor technology being used to provide ocean insights into the offshore um, industry, various industries. Um, so we've all sat through the various events on efficiencies and requirements for data sharing. Um, at Miros, our view is that true value for data or services is achieved by involving as many relevant departments and relevant stakeholders as possible, both off and onshore. So we have this one world view with, uh, with the provision of data. So the use of Miros IoT sensors and our cloud technology any asset has the ability to share real-time ocean data with the crew on the asset or operational team on shore, as well as vessels which may be servicing the field, uh, so encompassing all stakeholders. Uh, Miros is what we would describe as being a 35-year-old startup, and many of many people have heard of, of Miros uh, providing net ocean systems um, or, 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 um, or these uh, the, the requirements for, for met ocean systems offshore. Uh, but we made the leap into the provision of sensors. Um, now we're all we're in, involved in five different markets, the oil and gas being our, our traditional markets, as well as offshore operations, offshore wind, ports and coastal and shipping. Uh, we also have representation in uh, 28 countries around the world. So what we're actually providing, uh, we have this portfolio of IoT sensors and, and service applications. Uh, our main products uh, are the um, SM140 rangefinder uh, used for, uh, for, for uh, wave and air gap monitoring. Uh, we also have the EX version, which is available. And we also have the wave sensors. Uh, Can I interrupt the, uh, you, Andrew? Sorry to interrupt. You. I'm just going to try and introduce this screen again. I don't think I'm going to get this right. So I'm not too sure whether you're actually reading straight from your presentation, are you, or not? Or was that just that? Was uh -huh. it just a general? No, I'm, I'm just in the middle of the presentation. So yeah, yeah, okay, okay sorry. I, I don't think I'm going to get this to work. So it's only a minute. I will, I will try to work out how to do this for next time. But um, if I just play it anyway and um, see how we get on, I think it's – I get the sound on me. I'll – So instead of uh, sitting through the the the, the, uh, the dull tumbleweed here, what essentially what we're trying to demonstrate is the ability of neural sensors. We have uh, plug-and-play sensors which are self-calibrating, um, and we have the ability to be able to share real-time data. Um, as mentioned already, we've uh, we've been within the industry for, for over 35 years. Um, our 
IoT sensors bring a host of benefits um, on top of the, the provision of uh, real-time data. They're also all processing takes place within the unit themselves, so there's no requirement for external PCs. Um, uh, and on top of that, with uh, the cloud access um, and the Miros cloud platform, we have the ability to be able to monitor the sensors themselves, uh, bring in upgrades, uh, push those upgrades out, and provide remote monitoring or remote support, uh, something which is uh, incredibly uh, useful during the COVID year of 2020. Uh, if you wish, you can, uh, you can jump to uh, Miros.app, where we have some uh, real-time examples of our, uh, our, our monitoring software through the SM140. So anyway, that's a brief introduction to, um, to Miros and uh, to bring you all up to date. So we're going to pass over to Trim, in, uh, uh, sitting in our um, office in Asker, who's going to uh, talk a little bit more about the partitioning or the development we've been doing regarding weight partitioning. Yes, brilliant. Hello, uh, can everyone hear me OK? Wonderful. Right. Uh, yes, as Andrew said, my my name is Trim uh, Brusset. I am uh, working as a data scientist at uh, Miros. Uh, the presentation I'm about to give you is on a um, particular algorithm called uh, wave partitioning, which uh, the, the point of which is to extract more insight from a data format called the directional wave spectrum. Uh, now, this is a new approach. There are a few existing approaches that have some inherent problems that I'm going to uh, briefly uh, go over in the, in the presentation as well. Um, but this, uh, uh, this new approach is based on uh, a uh, field that is near and dear to me called algebraic topology. My, my background is actually from uh, mathematics, not necessarily... Uh, meteorological or oceanographic uh, industries. So uh, yeah, let's uh, go get right to it. There we go. Right, so uh, first a quick uh, overview of the presentation. I'm going to talk a little bit about the data itself, the directional wave spectrum. I'll uh, mention why we uh, actually need this new algorithm. Uh, the, the existing ones, as I mentioned, have a, a few inherent flaws that this algorithm uh, takes care of and it has some, some uh, new advantages as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about what's actually new about this new approach. Uh, we're going to go a little bit into the details of how it works. Uh, within the time span, we don't have time for, for the entire uh, sort of line by line, but the uh, Hopefully by the end of it, you'll, uh, you'll get a sense of what's going on. Uh, and then I'll talk about the two uh, outputs of the algorithm. The, um, that is actually one of the benefits uh, compared to the existing algorithms is that this one has two modes of operation or two outputs that are related, but uh, very useful for different use cases. Uh, I'll mention a method of evaluating and comparing the outputs of the algorithm and comparing this algorithm with other algorithms, uh, potentially. Uh, and finally, we'll round up with uh, a little talk about on uh, potential applications and uh, some works in progress. So, uh, as some of you might know, uh, there is a data format called the directional wave spectrum. It looks a bit like the image on the right there. Uh, it's a uh, generalization of the point spectrum. Uh, in fact, it's a strictly uh, richer data format because you can always get the point spectrum back from the directional wave spectrum. Uh, it gives an indication of the uh, frequency, the uh, energy and the direction of incoming wave systems. So in the example that you can see here on the screen, there are uh, two primary wave systems uh, coming in at um, uh, around 300 degrees uh, compared to true north and about 180. Uh, the frequencies uh, in question are about 0 0.5, 0 0.05 hertz and yeah, be between um, 0.1 and 0.2 hertz. The, these primary peaks here. Um, 
And uh, of course, this is uh, an example view of the uh, of the presentation of the data that we that you get from uh, from Mirus's uh, products. Now, the actual data is stored as a uh, array of uh, of floating point numbers, uh, and it, if you pass it through a uh, sort of a heat map plotting algorithm or, or heat map plot, it uh, looks uh, as you can see on screen. This is the same spectrum as you saw on the last uh, slide here. Uh, it's just a uh, sort of square view of it. Now, for the purposes of partitioning, the uh, the algorithm that I am uh, going to present to you uh, shortly uh, only relies on data from a single spectrum. In other words, it's a stateless algorithm, which is in itself a, a very uh, convenient uh, algorithm to work with. You do, you do not need uh, any historical data. You do not need any external sensors like wind vectors or anything like that. All you need is a single spectrum and you will get a partition spectrum at the end. So uh, why do we bother with another? The first uh, proposed partitioning algorithm was actually put forth in 1993. And uh, since then, uh, there's been a number of new approaches uh, that have been proposed. The, the problem is that the majority of them have gone away from the, uh, the initially proposed um, calculation scheme, which took quite a long time to compute. Uh, and instead, they turned towards uh, a concept called the watershed method. Now, the, <laughs> the problems with the algorithms that have uh, been, um, been proposed since then uh, all, always stem from the use of the watershed algorithm as the sort of core uh, data processing uh, uh, technique. And these are problems such as inefficient computation leading to very long computation times. So it's not suitable for real-time applications. Be very high sensitivity to noise in the input. So, yeah. you know, if you just slightly uh, change the, the input signal, you may get very... Uh, drastic variations in the output, um, which also uh, works for if the actual C state changes only slightly, like uh, if, if the frequency gets pushed up uh, or the angle changes slightly, for example, uh, when, the, when the wind direction changes. And it relies on a number of hidden parameters uh, that have very unpredictable consequences for, for the output of the algorithm. Uh, and what this means is that whenever you're setting up the algorithm, you have to go through a very lengthy and very problematic process called parameter tweaking, where you adjust a parameter a little bit and then you, you know, the, the output changes quite drastically. And hopefully you end up somewhere that, that works in the long term. So what is this problem that uh, is inherent with watershed? Well. The watershed uh, algorithm it, it divides the it, it starts off uh, dividing the uh, the entire spectrum into into regions based on the local maxima that are in the in the regions the, the sort of smaller peaks that you can find in the in the, in the spectrum. And the problem is on on the uh, in the image here you can see a, a spectrum which has it seems like it has one wave system with possibly two smaller peaks in it, but it's it's most likely supposed to be only one system. The output, however, of the watershed algorithm looks like this. It has 49 partitions. So the problem then is how do you how do you go from this to a, an actual sensible output? You have to merge quite a large number of these so that you get down to the possibly single uh, partition that you actually want. Now, the current Miros prototype, it takes in a uh, directional wave spectrum like this. It identifies the peaks and then it grows a region around those peaks. So it starts so, sort of at the other end. It, it doesn't start with the, with the partitioning and then sort of uh, try to, to massage that into something sensible. It starts with by selecting the data that you want and then expanding from there. Um, now, 
what makes this new approach really new is the way that you choose the peaks. So how do you identify them? Well, by looking at, for local maxima or you know peaks, of course. Um, and you have, uh, if you look at the image, there's one peak there, another peak right over there. The problem, however, is that there are quite a few local maxima and you do not want all of them. There's one over here, a couple down there. Uh, so what we need is a way to differentiate these peaks uh, in order to enable a smarter selection. Uh, the answer is what we call a persistence diagram. Now, the persistence diagram is actually a tool coming from algebraic topology. It's a uh, fairly recent um, uh, evolution from, from pure mathematics, but it's uh, it's found uses in, in quite a wide uh, range of, of fields from computer vision to now <laughs> oceanography. Um, and what it does is uh, the persistence diagram compares the peaks because uh, each point in the diagram represents a peak in spectrum. So the diagram in the lower right corner uh, it has scattered a, a couple of blue dots. Each of those dots represent a peak in the spectrum. Uh, now, the two axes on the diagram uh, are called the birth axis and the lifetime axis. And I'll try to explain briefly what these actually mean so that you get a sense of what's actually going on here. So in order to understand the persistence diagram, I have made a uh, little mock-up function. It's, uh, it's one dimensional, but the same principle works in, in one dimension as in exactly the same way as it does in two dimensions. Uh, and the way you can think about it is uh, imagine the curve that you can see here, the red curve, as a land landscape that is submerged by water. Uh, now, the level of the water is steadily sinking. Uh, and the birth of a peak is the level at which that peak appears. So when the water, uh, if I can get my laser pick. So when the water passes this point, this peak uh, gets its birth value and, and appears. When the water goes all the way down here, this peak appears. And at that point, you have two uh, isolated uh, sort of islands uh, showing up in this submerged landscape. And as the uh, water level uh, decreases further, you get to the death point of a peak. Uh, and that is the point where it connects to a tall peak. So in, in other words, where the saddle point is between the smaller of the peaks and a, a neighboring higher peak. So this saddle point here uh, the, the marks the death point of this peak and the lifetime is simply the difference between these two. So it, it's, it measures how persistent this peak is uh, compared to, say, for example, this one. Right, so if we actually look at the at the numbers in, in the in the diagram, uh, you can see that the diagram is normalized. So the uh, the, the maximum energy of the spectrum is represented as uh, you know one or one hundred percent of the uh, of the energy, uh, and in both terms of um, of uh, of lifetime and and of birth, and the the earliest. Uh, so the highest peak has a value has a birth value of one, and it has a lifetime of one uh, because the the uh, you can't have negative energy. And the diagram it shows uh, two distinct peaks over here that have a fairly high birth value and a fairly high uh, lifetime value as well. Uh, as well, there is a profile of uh, what I call noise down here in the in the left hand corner, and these things are uh, sort of the the smaller local maxima that you can't even see because their 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 value is is so low compared to the uh, to the primary ones. Now, uh, separating the persistent peaks from the rest is actually what distinguishes this approach from the water based algorithms. Um, because by by finding out the persistent peaks, you can uh, you have a, a much better starting position to, to to make a better algorithm uh, in a, 
basically. Uh, and the secondary benefit is that this is very has a very high tolerance for noise in the input, uh, and in fact that is a prove uh, that is provable. And I can show you an example here. So here I have an image, same spectrum, um, right here, uh, with the identified peaks. And then underneath here, I have the same spectrum, but with added a, uh, a uniform noise of 20% of the max energy, uh, which is quite considerable, uh, a quite considerable amount of noise. Um, but if you look at the, uh, at the persistence diagram here, you can see the, the blue uh, the blue plus signs represents the original uh, spectrum and the red crosses represents the noisy uh, noisy spectrum. So you can see the two primary peaks have barely moved at all uh, and the noisy uh, section, uh, although it grows a little bit, it, it, it remains quite clearly separated from the primary peaks of the spectrum. Right, so when you have a, uh, a persistence diagram like this uh, for a given spectrum, uh, you can make a selection of peaks. You can, you can choose the ones you want. Uh, and once you have selected the peaks that you want, then you can locate them within the spectrum. So uh, say, for example, if we do choose these two that are quite distinguished, the, these two peaks, then you can, you can locate these peaks in the spectrum. However, if we uh, choose a more <laughs> inclusive uh, selection and simply choose all the peaks, then you can see uh, there are quite a few local maxima in, in the spectrum that you do not necessarily want to consider uh, as separate wave systems. Now, once you've found the appropriate peaks, uh, the ones you want, uh, we can actually use a process called region growing. Uh, now, the region growing is, is a uh, technique from uh, image processing and uh, computer science. Uh, and what that requires is a number of initial points and some conditions for inclusion for each region. And what it does, what it ends up doing is uh, it splits up an image into, into these regions based on the initial points uh, or the seeds and the, the conditions. Now, obviously, as initial point, we use the chosen peaks, these two. And as conditions for inclusions, uh, we define what's called a distribution for each peak. Now, the distributions, um, you can think of a distribution as an indication of how likely a point is to belong to a given region. Um, I have a, a little animated GIF here showing uh, on the left there, you can see a wave spectrum uh, with a quite significant uh, single uh, wave system present. And on the right side, you can see it's associated distribution. Uh, now, it's not meant to be uh, fitting the curve exactly. It's, it's more a measure of how likely is each uh, frequency and angle how, how how likely is that point in the spectrum to belong to that uh, region? Now, the way we define these things is that for each peak, um, we define a distribution by this uh, formula here. It has the um, it has the same uh, domain as the as the spectrum, so it's defined over the entire spectrum, all the angles and frequencies. Uh, for each peak, so if you choose uh, three peaks, then you get three distributions. And then following that, there's a somewhat complicated uh, uh, function here that relies on uh, two parameters, these uh, sigmas here. Um, now, these sigmas, they define the shape of the distribution. Um, and finally, the distributions are scaled to match their peaks. Uh, I have prepared an animation here as well that shows the same spectrum as earlier uh, with the same distribution, but then uh, it's varying both the, the sigma parameters. So it's uh, increasing these gradually too. And you can see how 
this inclusion criteria grows and grows. So uh, somewhere within this range, uh, you might find a sort of sensible dis distribution to use. Now for spectra with uh, multiple uh, modes or uh, a multimodal sea state. So for example, if there are two instances of swell and one of, uh, of wind sea, something like that, it happens quite a lot in the North Sea, uh, then each of the peaks uh, get their own distribution like this. Now, what about the output of the algorithm? So this here is a, uh, a snapshot of the, uh, of the output of the algorithm, uh, of one of the outputs. So this output is a copy of the original spectrum uh, with index values instead of energy levels. So you know, we have the same angles, same frequencies, uh, and then you can uh, use this as an, an indexing to differentiate sort of the background from the, uh, the different uh, regions that you want to consider. Uh, this works very well for spectra like this. Uh, where the wave systems are clearly separated. There's a, sort of a valley of, of nothing between them. And uh, you can sort of put a ring around them and say, okay, this is one wave system. However, that is not always the case. Uh, it's much less suited for conditions where the wave systems are very close to each other. Uh, now I do have an example of that as well, uh, which you can see here. Now this spectrum contains a uh, uh, a, a number of peaks uh, with what is might be considered uh, a single wave system here, although it's quite spread out in, in terms of angles. Uh, so what we might have here is actually a, a case where, uh, where there might be, for example, uh, these two systems are examples of swell and these two are an old and a new wind sea. So when the when the wind direction changes, a new wind sea arises, uh, which might be quite close to the old wind sea, but you might still want to differentiate them. Now, uh, when you use the indexed uh, partition, the regions look quite artificially cropped, like the, the, the very straight line you can see here doesn't seem quite natural uh, in terms of, you know, the uh, how a wave system might look uh, towards the edges. Uh, but the good thing about this algorithm and the approach that I, uh, I'm proposing here is that instead of uh, using this indexing, we can actually distribute the energy between the partitions. Uh, and that's exactly what I have done here. So here we have the same, same spectrum with the index partition and this graphic here shows um, a, a way of distributing the energy uh, in, in the spectrum between each of the regions rather than cropping them as I've done here on the right. So you can see it looks quite artificial if you, if you just select the, uh, the cropped regions. Now, in the uh, distributive uh, case, you know, this, this peak here uh, gets this region associated with it, um, similar with that one and these two. Um, and the neat thing is that the way that the energy is distributed uh, on the partitions is based on the exact same structure. There's, there's no change in the algorithm that you can use the same distributions, you can use the same peak identification. Uh, the, the, there's virtually no change at all required to, to, to do this step. Um, yeah, and, and this case happens, for example, in, in conditions where the wind direction changes. Now, in order to, to say, you know, how, how well these, uh, these algorithms work, uh, we need a method of evaluating them. And uh, what I propose is, um, or the, uh, the sort of setting that we have is that, uh, you know, if you've chosen n peaks uh, from the uh, persistence diagram, then the index partitioning gives you n plus one indices, uh, you know, the, the one being for the background. And uh, so if, if you chose three peaks, then you get three peaks plus the background. And the distributive uh, output gives you just three partitions. 
Uh, and then by extracting the original spectral energy for each partition, uh, you can make the the following um, uh, point spectrum plots. So uh, in this plot, the uh, we are comparing the the indexed uh, output from the algorithm, and you can see the the blue line here. You can you can barely see it in some places represents the original point spectrum. So that, that's the point spectrum that you get from just the whole, uh, just the whole spectrum. So if, if you do not record any directional information, that's the, that's the curve that you might have, say from, uh, uh, from uh, another wave monitoring system that doesn't record directional information. And what you can see is that we were able to split this uh, directional wave spectrum or this uh, point spectrum into uh, the uh, the desired partitions, and there's a very low sort of general uh, background noise lying uh, lying across all frequencies. Uh, similarly, we can do do the same thing with the the overlapping. Uh, in this case, we we only have two peaks, so we only get two two curves, and these curves they do sum up to to the original point spectrum. Now, finally, I have a uh, sort of a demonstration of the, the current uh, prototype that we have, uh, sort of in, in action on, uh, on some data. Um, it shows sort of the, the stability of, of the output from based on the, on the input. The, the colors here are, are based on the indexing. So um, in, in terms of tagging or in terms of tracking these systems, the, the colors are completely arbitrary. They, they do change as the relative energy changes between these uh, these systems. Uh, and this is you know just the, the raw internal output of, of the algorithm. And the, the point is that you can differentiate and you can sort of um, uh, separate these regions of, of the plot reliably over time. Uh, and do some further analysis on it. You can build further applications on this uh, sort of da data extraction. Speaking of applications, um, one of the immediate applications might be tagging partitions, such as uh, tagging WinSea and, uh, and Swell uh, systems, uh, separating systems of Swell, uh, and uh, as we saw, all the new WinSea. Um, it can be used for improving safety systems. So, for example, uh, on board uh, moving vessels, some sea conditions are more um, prone to to lead to to catastrophic situations like parametric rolling, or uh, some sea conditions are, are more prone to to generate rogue waves, for example. And uh, the uh, it, it's the manner in which these wave systems relate to each other that uh, might say something about these uh, these conditions. Uh, you can obviously isolate the impact of a single system. So say, for example, if you're not interested in WinSea, you can just isolate the, the effects of, of swell. Uh, you can track systems reliably over time. Uh, you can process data for use in machine learning applications. So, for example, in, in training models, in, in, in processing data, in, in other ways. Um, it's a very convenient way to, to collapse a, co a complex data structure like the directional wave spectrum into something simpler. And that, that's uh, sort of the crux of the issue. Uh, or, you, or you can use it for more detailed sea state summaries. Uh, now, the, uh, some current work in progress is uh, automated parameter adjustments. Uh, currently, th there aren't too many parameters involved. Uh, you have the two parameters define, that define the shape of the distributions. You saw them uh, as, as I uh, vary them from, from, from very low levels to very high levels. The, the distributions changed shape. Um, and the output of the algorithm changes continuously based on these changes. So if, if you, uh, you know, increase the parameters a little bit, you see a slight increase in, in, the, in the output as well. Uh, I've one, uh, one parameter that defines the cutoff for the index partition, that, that's basically, it, it just defines the, uh, the level at which you want to set the, uh, the background uh, partition. And 
uh, as with the other two parameters, uh, this or the the algorithm also changes continuously based on this parameter. So if you change it slightly, the output changes slightly. You don't have to to do the hassle of of uh, parameter tweaking. Uh, finally, there's one parameter used for the peak selection process. Um, this is not needed. You you can uh, set this uh, in in other ways. Uh, but at the moment, I've uh, I'm testing out a uh, uh, a method of doing it based on on a single parameter that chooses the the most significant peaks, and that that's uh, that's the um, uh, that's the uh, that, that's used in the in the algorithm that I used to uh, to provide all the graphics that you've seen uh, use that same peak selection process. Uh, also work in progress is actual rigorous field testing where we are working on getting this onto uh, you know uh, vessels and workstations making sure that it uh, relies or, or, or behaves predictably uh, you know certain sea states behave quite differently and um, there are a few use cases where the uh, the structure that uh, the radars are mounted on generate their own sort of waves, uh, and we we want to sort of filter out those waves from the uh, the actual incoming uh, wind sea and and swell waves. So uh, yeah, there's there's some field testing to to be done still, but there is a uh, we have a journal article coming out um, as as soon as that testing is done and the uh, results are evaluated, and. Um, yeah, that, that's been a very brief and uh, quick uh, overview of, of the new wave partitioning algorithm. Now, uh, there's time for, for questions. If you don't have any, I do have a very quick demonstration that shows how uh, quick the algorithm actually works. It's... Uh... I think that would be wise. I haven't actually got many questions coming in from anybody at the moment. I do... I, I... Very uh, intense uh, twenty minutes there. For, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I do. I do realise that it's. Uh... No, but it, it's. Uh, I have to very much focus on what you're saying. Shall I bring Andrew back into the picture as well? Maybe he can provide as well. I think I'll try and do bring a third person in here. So we've got Andrew, so that Miros is represented in, in three uh, three passes. But yeah, you wanted to say something more, Trim. I remember you mentioned something about this at the start. So maybe I should just be quiet and let you. And then I'll, we have. I do have one question. So. Um, hopefully that expands into two or three. Yeah. Um, well, in the meantime, I have a very quick demonstration of the algorithm in work in, in as it as it is to add today. Uh, so, I'm working in in uh, primarily in Python, uh, and in this uh, notebook that I'm working in, um, the only thing I've done is I, I've loaded in the the libraries and I have loaded in some data. Now the actual partitioning algorithm itself is this whole thing here. Uh, this is the entire thing. Uh, and I've also uh, put in some, uh, what we need to, to actually run it on one of the one of the spectra that I've loaded in previously. Um, in addition to this, I have added a little uh, timer here. So what it does is it runs the algorithm about 70 times. Uh, and it calculates the average time it takes to load the entire algorithm, uh, run the entire algorithm, and produce the output um, without the visualizations. But this is sort of uh, indicates how quick the algorithm actually works. There, there it's done. And yeah, so loading the entire. Uh, the, the entire algorithmic structure and uh, running it through the data, you know, uh, with all, all the processing done, it takes about 320 uh, milliseconds on average. Uh, if you have the, uh, the the functions and everything loaded into memory, it takes about uh, hundred between 70 and 100 uh, milliseconds to run. So it's, you know, it's, uh, it's fine to run in, in real time uh, for sure. And just to, to give you an indication of what the data that we, uh, hmm. oh yeah, I need to, uh, 
it does, doesn't actually store the variables in memory when I, when I do the timing. Yeah. Can I ask whilst you're talking, Trim, a couple of questions? And um, just wanted to understand a little bit more some of the real world applications for this, where uh, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. Andrew can provide some. Uh, it, like I said, it's quite highbrow, um, but it, very informative and very interesting. So, what? Who are your clients, or who are you attempting to sell this to, and, and which fields are going to benefit mostly from this new way of work, working and thinking? Who wants to? Uh, do you, uh, Andrew, do you want to take that? Yeah, this is something which is going to, um, <clears throat> pardon me, it's going to be applicable to to all of our clients who are looking to to analyze waves and swells, uh, or swell um, old and new swell data, and wind, uh, wind and wave data. Uh, it'll be applicable into the oil industry as well as into renewables. Uh, we already um, we already have a um, significant number um, of of, uh, of sensors out there in both of those industries. Um, as it stands, both on platforms uh, where data is being used uh, from anything from the, the, the old Halidec monitoring systems all the way through to uh, feeding uh, the data into asset integrity monitoring. So, yeah, there's a host of applications. Okay. Oh. Yeah. And um, uh, what I've personally been involved with is, um, you know, uh, work on, uh, on the, in the shipping industry, in the offshore wind industry, have uh, seen some uh, use for, potential use for this. Um, and uh, offshore operations, uh, it's, it's been, uh, yeah, I've been involved with a couple of, you know, sort of alpha stage uh, projects. Um, and we, uh, we are going to make use of this most likely in, in a, uh, uh, in, in a sort of larger scale of uh, co collaborative work that we're doing now with uh, with the shipping industry for example but uh, yeah it's uh, as andrew says it's uh, it's relevant for anyone who who uh, who's dealing with sea states basically and uh, is it uh, is it an is it a, a work in progress or an, essentially almost a finished product here um or, or is it continually evolving so it's a uh, you know the 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 algorithm is functioning as you've seen demonstrated, yeah. Uh, and the uh, you know the most of the structure is there. The uh, I can actually pull up the um, so. Um, uh, the uh, the mirrors app um, it shows a number of the sites that we uh, that we have. Um, so is this one of the areas where this approach has been tested? Then is that uh... yes? So this is one of the places where it's going to be implemented uh, yeah. shortly. It's um, you can see the the wave spectrum here on uh, on the mirrors app and it's uh, you know being updated uh, continuously you you have real time access to this data yeah. and um, one mm -hmm. one of the planned planned applications of the uh, partitioning algorithm is as sort of a data analysis um, section on this uh, product for example okay uh, what uh, what Trim is is is, uh, is demonstrating here is live data right now. Um, okay. Yeah. We, yeah. This is live yeah. data. Mm. And uh, uh, Nikki uh, Nichols has kindly provided a question as well, based on what I just mentioned there. But so, uh, what what have you found any limitations at all uh, based on the real data? What you've what you've done to date? Uh, coming through. I just wondered if you'd found any limitations with this this new um, algorithm and approach is there is that really um, well uh, I mean it's um, the uh, from the offset I uh, I was actually going to try and implement it the uh, what I was looking to do was make an implementation of the watershed based algorithms uh, that, that's sort of docu well documented in uh, in, uh, in in published papers, but uh, what I found during that uh, that work was how troublesome the the watershed uh, algorithm part of it uh, actually made the algorithm, and how, how unpredictable it was. And the the reason I I started off uh, working on this was to uh, 
to to work on all those issues and the issues that i i found the most pressing was the the real time application issue uh, you know the long computation times the uh, instability of the output based on the inputs uh, instability under noisy conditions and um one of the um, one of the problems that I, I read during uh, you know the, the research phase was in cases such as the one I, I shown where where the wind direction changes so you get sort of new and old wind sea overlapping quite quite significantly uh, that's also a use case that the water based uh, or watershed algorithm uh, does very poorly yeah. uh, so so in, in essence you know the the algorithm does um does address all, all the issues that i i set out to uh, to address excellent <laughs> okay uh, I, I i imagine you know one of the one of the actual problems is that it is a little bit highbrow you know it, it relies on some fairly uh, fairly advanced mathematics so you know enabling people to 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 see the value of it as it is now mm. is uh, maybe perhaps not so feasible but this is that the point of this algorithm is to uh, process the data so that you can build applications on it it's the first step of a pipeline yeah. uh, you know you take a complex data set like the directional wave spectrum and you make it uh, more suited for further analysis basically you extract the insight from it uh, okay. or, or you yeah. enable the extraction of insight Okay, Andrew, is there anything you wanted to add at all, just to maybe wind up this as we reach the two-hour mark? Yeah, yeah I'm sure everybody's uh, a little bit tired and, and looking to enjoy a beer. But uh, yeah, I mean, essentially, expanding upon what Trin is saying, that you know, the, the development is also ongoing um, in terms of the application for uh, for the data that Miros are able to provide. Now, uh, at the moment, we are we're involved with the renewables industry for. Uh, for, for placement of the range finders on board uh, on board turbines, we're able to provide uh, real time monitoring of sea state uh, data there instead of using a, a wave boy, which is potentially kilometers away. Um, our, our sensors are, are also on board uh, offshore installations as well. Again, uh, the applications are vast. What we're attempting to do here is to bring value into the organization. Uh, and, and pool that value through the organization at the same time. Uh, so, so it's, you know, we, we've gone from the, the, the old days of providing um, helideck monitoring systems and met ocean systems, moving into where the data can really provide value to an organization, either through extending the life of an asset um, or through, 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 through operational activities. But the, making the most important thing is that data is real time. Um, yeah. Instead of uh, instead of relying upon forecast data, the, you're, you're able to build uh, build that pipe as, uh, as Trim has mentioned. Use the uh, use forecast data for the planning, and then use our real time data for operational decision making. Absolutely. Mm. And to just just to echo echo uh, one of the uh, use cases that was you know proposed earlier, the uh, the erosion of the of the seabed. Uh, you know, uh, since that is primarily uh, dependent on, you know, wave conditions, uh, wave height and direction, you know, you could potentially extract some some useful insight from if you get wave directional wave spectra for the last three years, for example, you could do this, use this algorithm to to determine uh, which, uh, you know, um, which of the uh, turbines are, are most likely to to uh, to All experience right. erosion, the, the the most likely levels of erosion that you can expect to find, uh, you know, this uh, I think the use cases are in principle limitless. It's uh, it's based on the applications and the and the insight you you want to to extract from it. Perfect. Well, maybe we can invite you back in a, maybe half a year's time, and there's some some more some more uh, applications, real life applications that we can talk into, and then I think probably the uh, the parts of the jigsaw will come together. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's probably about it. I don't think there's much more. Um, I, we've reached the two hour mark, which is exactly what we we forecast. So I'd like to thank uh, all the presenters, Trim, uh, Andrew, Drew, and Geraint. Most of you are all still there. I would recommend anyone who would like to um, 
to go over to the forum is still uh, Selena's in there fielding some questions. So uh, I would like to thank once again everyone for their attendance. Um, I'll try to get resolved with the sound issues for next time and it'll be a lot slicker. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at the next event. So goodbye for now. And uh, yeah, keep looking on the uh, websites of NOSP and stay tuned to LinkedIn as well and the, um, the Scottish Hydrograph Society. Good night and thank you very much for everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye for now. Bye for now.